Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on an ASMR adventure into the history of Santa Claus. Santa, with his jolly face, white beard and glowing red suit, is pretty much the ultimate personification of Christmas within the Western world these days. And each year, on Christmas Eve, Millions of children write a letter to him, asking for particular gifts, and leave out little offerings of food or drink for Santa and his reindeer. However, Santa Claus himself is an interesting combination of several different legendary Christmas figures who have merged together over the years. And so, in this talk, we're going to take a look at the origins of Santa, We'll explore a few of his early forerunners, who range from a pagan Norse god to a Greek Christian bishop. And we'll discover some of the many literary and artistic representations of him. As usual, there'll be some images to accompany our talk on the video slideshow, but there's no need for you to look at them if you don't want to. If you prefer, you can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to the history of Santa Claus. In the Northern Hemisphere, the tradition of holding some sort of midwinter festival, or ceremony of light, goes back far beyond the Christian celebration of Christmas. It stems, perhaps, from an almost universal human desire to create and commemorate a moment of light, and warmth at the very darkest time of the year. One of the earliest examples of a Northern Hemisphere midwinter festival that we know about is Yule, or Yule, which was celebrated in different ways by various early Germanic and Scandinavian tribes. Often in these celebrations, the god Odin, who is seen as the wise and elderly father of the world, was given the name of Yulfather which means Yule Father, or Yulnis, which means the Yule One. And it's this Yuletide identification of Odin, with his long flowing beard, that can perhaps be seen as an early pagan forerunner to the figure who would later become Santa Claus. With the spread of Christianity, the traditional pagan festivals of Europe were co-opted by the early church and the midwinter festivals of light were unified under the celebration of Christ's birth, known as Christmas. However, although this development theoretically placed the Christian figure of the baby Jesus at the front and centre of the celebrations, the personification of Christmas as a separate and distinct figure continued to persist, and he seems to have coexisted quite peacefully with the more religious aspect of the season. In England in the mid-1400s, Richard Smart, who was himself a clergyman, wrote a carol called Sir Christmas, which includes the lyrics, I am here, Sir Christmas. Welcome, my Lord Christmas. There's also a 1443 record of a man being dressed as the King of Christmas in a local festival that occurred in the city of Norwich, while in the city of York. The figure of Yule and his wife would ride out every 21st of December. Later, during the 15th and 16th centuries, the figure of Lord Yule or Captain Christmas was known to feature in Mama's plays, which were popular performances of stories tied to local celebrations or saints' festivals. The figure of Old Christmas also appears in a fragment of a play script that was printed by William Rastel in 1533, where he comes across as a very virtuous character who's aligned to the forces of Christianity. It's not until nearly a century later, in 1616, that we find a printed description of a Christmas figure who is more recognisable as a forerunner to the secular figure of Santa Claus. And he appears in a work by the playwright Ben Jonson called Christmas, His Mask. In this play, which was performed before the king, James I, as a festive light entertainment, the figure of Christmas specifically refers to himself as 
Captain Christmas, in line with the earlier tradition of Mama's plays. And Ben Jonson describes him in the stage directions as wearing a high-crowned hat and having a long, thin beard. He's portrayed as a merry and slightly anarchic leader of revels and good cheer, who presides over a comical troop of children that entertain the king with songs and dances. As such, he's very much a prototype for the jolly Santa Claus figure that we know today. I'll add here that if you'd like to listen to a reading of Ben Jonson's Christmas Mask, you can check out the Beyond Shakespeare YouTube channel, where you'll find a video of a bunch of actors, myself included, reading and discussing the play. The mask is rather fascinating from an historical perspective, because it touches on a host of festive customs and games that were popular in the 17th century, and these give us a glimpse into early English Christmas celebrations. It's also a very funny play. As well as the figure of Captain Christmas himself, it also features an early depiction of an hilariously pushy stage mother, who is played by yours truly, in suitably silly festive headgear. So, if you're interested in finding out what I get up to when I'm not making ASMR videos, this is your chance. I'll put a link in the description below the video. While Johnson's figure of Christmas refers to himself as Captain Christmas, over the course of the next 50 years, his name was to shift to the more paternal title of Father Christmas, and it did so for surprisingly political reasons. In 1642, the English Civil War broke out, and as a result, the Puritans took control of Britain. As I'm sure you know, Puritanism was a very strict and radical interpretation of Protestant Christianity, and it didn't tolerate any other form of religion at all. Consequently, when they came to power, the Puritans banned all religious festivals that were associated with the Catholic Christian tradition and that included Christmas. Needless to say, this turned out to be a deeply unpopular move with the majority of ordinary people, regardless of their religious persuasions. And so, in January 1646, a puritanical pamphlet was printed, called The Arraignment, Conviction and Imprisoning of Christmas. And this pamphlet aimed to promote the Puritan view of Christmas and convince people that celebrating it was a terrible idea. It's within this pamphlet that we find the first specific printed reference to Father Christmas, and the use of the term Father seems to have been a deliberate choice on the part of the writer, because while the earlier name of Captain Christmas implies a degree of robust authority, Father Christmas could be portrayed as a rather weak and feeble character, and he's described as a hoary-headed man of great years and as white as snow, full and fat as any dumb doctor. Although this description of Father Christmas is deliberately meant to be unflattering and was designed to turn people away from the idea of celebrating Christmas, it managed to backfire in quite a spectacular way, because the term father has associations with nurturance and kindness that the title captain doesn't necessarily convey. Consequently, Father Christmas became an even more relatable and sympathetic figure. The anti-Puritan movement was soon using him for their own ends. In 1652, a pro-Christmas pamphlet entitled The Vindication of Christmas was published, and in this pamphlet, Father Christmas appears to be a far more kindly and merry figure. Then, in 1658, another pamphlet, called The Examination and Trial of Old Father Christmas, also portrayed the figure in a friendly and welcoming light. And interestingly, it came complete with an illustration of the figure, which depicted Old Father Christmas as a serene, elderly gentleman, with flowing white locks and beard, and a fur-trimmed cap and gown. In 1660, the monarchy was restored to Britain, and so was the legal celebration of Christmas. 
you might expect that, at this point, the figure of Father Christmas would be solidified and celebrated with even greater enthusiasm. But, interestingly, the reverse seems to have happened. Although he'd played a significant role in keeping Christmas alive during the Puritan years, once those years were over, Father Christmas actually sank back into oblivion, and he continued to languish in relative obscurity throughout the 18th century. It wasn't until the beginning of the 19th century that he was once again culturally resurrected in the popular imagination, and his return was stage-managed largely through the efforts of three particular authors. The first of these authors was Sir Walter Scott, the Scottish novelist and poet, who was an incredibly popular and influential writer at the beginning of the 19th century. Scott was interested in folklore and legends, and through his work, he was responsible for helping to solidify the reputations of several British folk heroes in the public imagination, including the Scottish outlaw Rob Roy and the English outlaw Robin Hood. He also helped to resuscitate the figure of Father Christmas through his historical romance poem, Marmion. This poem was published in 1808, and it's mainly concerned with the apparently deeply un Christmassy topic of the Battle of Flodden Field. Nevertheless, at the beginning of Canto VI of the poem, there are three long stanzas that capture Scott's concept of the ideal, traditional Christmas. At the end of the third stanza, Scott concludes with England was merry England when old Christmas brought his sports again. Twas Christmas broached the mightiest ale. Twas Christmas told the merriest tale. A Christmas Campbell oft would cheer a poor man's heart through half the year. As you can see from this extract, Scott deftly wove together the figure of old Christmas with the romanticised idea of merry England. And this potent combination proved so popular that, later on in the 19th century, the Christmas stanzas from Marmion were extracted and published in their own volume, called Christmas in the Olden Time. It was this revivification of the figure of Old Christmas by Scott that inspired another Scottish author, Thomas Kibble Harvey, to continue the resurrection of the character. Today, Harvey has been largely forgotten, but in 1836, he published an extremely influential work called The Book of Christmas. In theory, this was supposed to be a factual history book that collected together all the old British Christmas customs that Harvey could find. However, in practice, the author embellished his material with vivid fictional scenes. And in his description of Father Christmas, he evokes a jolly, magical figure with a white beard, who wears a fur gown and a holly wreath on his head, and who rides around the city streets and country lanes on a goat, visiting every household with good cheer. With perhaps the exception of the goat, this description is one we can all definitely recognise as an early invocation of Santa Claus and in the illustration by the artist Robert Seymour that accompanied the text, we can also find a pictorial link between the earlier, Puritan-era depiction of Father Christmas and the many jollier versions of him that would spring up in later years. The third writer who influenced and helped to solidify the 19th century image of Father Christmas was, of course, Charles Dickens. In 1843, Dickens published A Christmas Carol, in which the jovial figure of the ghost of Christmas present wears a long beard, fur-trimmed robes, and a holly wreath. John Leach, the artist who was commissioned by Dickens to create the illustrations for A Christmas Carol, interpreted Dickens' description in a now iconic sketch of a jolly giant who is surrounded by plenty and who delights in flying around every neighbourhood on Christmas Day, sprinkling good cheer and happiness all around him. 
these jolly festive characters that were conjured by Scott, Harvey and Dickens were visually fortified by the Illustrated London News, which was founded in 1842 and which featured an illustration of Old Father Christmas, complete with beard, holly wreaths and long robes, in almost every Christmas issue. Consequently, by the mid-Victorian era, the image of Father Christmas was beginning to become quite standardised in the public imagination. And at the same time, his reputation for gift-giving was also growing, thanks largely to the influence of a different bearded personification of Christmas, St. Nicholas. Unlike Father Christmas, St. Nicholas's origins can be traced back to a real person. A 4th century Greek bishop, Nicholas of Myra, who was known for bestowing gifts upon the poor and needy. Over time, many myths grew up about Nicholas's generosity, including one that involves him giving dowries to three poor Christian sisters, and another that tells how he paid for a ship full of grain, which was needed to feed the populace during a time of famine. A further and rather macabre legend about Nicholas relates how he miraculously resurrected three children who had been murdered by a butcher and pickled in a barrel so that he could sell them to unsuspecting customers as ham. In spite of this colourfully grisly tale, the actual historical facts that we know about Nicholas are rather less sensational and rather less edifying. He's known, for example, to have raised to the ground the most ancient temple in Myra, simply because he feared its beauty would distract people from the Christian faith. There's also a record of him slapping another bishop around the face for daring to disagree with him. Nevertheless, the legends that surround Nicholas, particularly those concerning his gift-giving and his protection of children, developed and mingled over the centuries and eventually led to a charming seasonal custom based on St. Nicholas's feast day on the 6th of December. This tradition involves children polishing their shoes to demonstrate to St. Nicholas what good children they are and then leaving the shoes out overnight in the hopes that the saint will visit the house and fill them with coins, toys and treats. St. Nicholas is always viewed as a benign figure, but in many different countries, he's also often accompanied by a sinister, demon-like companion who punishes the naughty children while St. Nicholas rewards the good ones. This demonic sidekick has different names and aspects, depending on which country you're in. In Austria, Croatia, Hungary and Slovenia, he's known as Krampus. In parts of Germany, he's called Connect Ruprecht, and in France, he is Père Foutard. However, in all traditions, it's possible that his cultural origins stem from that scary figure of the murderous butcher, who pickles children in the earlier St. Nicholas legend. The centuries-old custom of St. Nicholas bringing gifts to good children is one that is still upheld in many parts of mainland Europe today. However, it was waves of 18th and 19th century immigration from Europe to America that was responsible for both St. Nicholas and Father Christmas crossing the Atlantic. They weren't the only ones to do so. Other festive European figures, such as Père Noël from France and La Befana from Italy, also made the crossing. And once they reached American shores, they melded together in a magical cultural swirling and became the single figure of Santa Claus. Santa Claus, as an American amalgamation of many different European Christmas figures, embodies, I think, the best qualities of all of them. He has the jovial and slightly anarchic aspect of the British Father Christmas, but he also has the generosity and affinity with children that comes directly from the St. Nicholas tradition, but without the scary sidekick. However, 
many of his individual character traits, such as his ability to fly across the sky or slide down a chimney to deliver presents, are a uniquely American invention, and they mainly come from the pen of the author, Washington Irving. In 1809, Irving, who would later become known for classics such as Rip Van Winkle and Sleepy Hollow, published his first book, a satire called A History of New York from the Beginning of the World to the End of the Dutch Dynasty by Dietrich Knickerbocker. In this mock history, he describes the figure of St. Nicholas as a sort of uber-patron saint and guardian angel of the city of New York who travelled over from the Netherlands with the Dutch founders of the city and blessed and looked after its early inhabitants. However, Irving says, in later times that all changed. The good St Nicholas would often make his appearance in his beloved city of a holiday afternoon, riding jollily among the treetops or over the roofs of houses, now and then drawing forth magnificent presents from his breeches' pockets, and dropping them down the chimneys of his favourites. Whereas in these degenerate days of iron and brass, he never shows us the light of his countenance, nor ever visits us, save one night in the year, when he rattles down the chimneys of the descendants of the patriarchs, confining his presence merely to the children, in token of the degeneracy of the parents. Whilst this description is undoubtedly satirical, the details that Irving described in his fanciful history would later become an established part of the Santa Claus canon. However, the name Santa Claus, which also comes from the Netherlands, being a corruption of the word Sinterklaas, which is the Dutch title for St. Nicholas, wasn't coined by Washington Irving. The first written record of it being used arrives in an anonymous Christmas poem called Old Santa Claus with Much Delight, which was published in 1821. The poem was accompanied by eight illustrations, and one of these depicts Santa as a bearded figure in a red coat who is riding in a sleigh pulled by a single reindeer. Two years later, in 1823, one reindeer was replaced by eight of them, in Clement Clark Moore's poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, which is more popularly known today by its opening line of Twas the Night Before Christmas. This version of the Santa Claus legend, which draws heavily from both Old Santa Claus with Much Delight and also Washington Irving's descriptions, was the final element that fixed the popular vision of Santa Claus in the public imagination as a jolly old elf who comes bearing gifts. Later writers continued to develop the character of Santa Claus and the world around him. In 1906, the writer Frank L. Baum, the author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, published The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, a story which focuses very much on Santa as a magical maker of toys who has pixie and fairy assistants. Meanwhile, back in the UK, the fantasy writer J.R.R. R. Tolkien, who of course is best known for The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, wrote a series of annual letters from Father Christmas, which also elaborated on the legend of Santa Claus living at the North Pole, and filled in many delightful and imaginative details about his helper elves and his friend, the polar bear. Tolkien's collected Father Christmas letters are now published and available to buy, but they began life as a series of private letters which he wrote for his children every Christmas between 1920 and 1943. And interestingly, towards the end of the cycle, the letters become increasingly dark, as Santa is forced to go to war with evil goblins, this plot development echoes, of course, the real-life scenario that was playing out in World War II at the time, and it reflected Tolkien's own anxieties about the world that his children were growing up in. Like all great cultural icons, Santa Claus is also a societal barometer 
who reflects our experience of the world back to us. And so, while he's usually associated very much with children, his importance to adults as a symbol of generosity and hope during times of hardship is an equally significant part of his legend. One of the most famous examples of a text that specifically connects Santa Claus with a symbolic force for good is a newspaper column that was written for the New York Sun in 1897 under the heading, Is There a Santa Claus? The editorial had been written by the journalist Francis Varcellus Church as a response to a letter the paper had received from an eight-year-old girl called Virginia O'Hanlon. Virginia had asked her father if Santa Claus really existed, and her father, presumably dreading having to give a straight answer, neatly sidestepped the question by suggesting that she write and ask the editor of the newspaper, because, if you see it in the sun, it's so. So Virginia wrote, and Church replied in a way that reframed Santa Claus as a figure whom everyone could believe in. Yes, Virginia, Church wrote, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are, unseen and seeable in the world. This uplifting reply, which is known today by the affirming phrase, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, has become a cherished piece of Christmas folklore in America. And it definitely encapsulates a philosophy that still accompanies the legend of Santa today. The importance of belief in intangible qualities that can't be seen in themselves, but instead manifest through the good actions of humans. This aspect of Santa Claus, as a symbol of hope and belief, gave his character a spiritual context that seemed to develop further as the 20th century wore on. And it happened in reverse proportion to the popularity of organised religion. As the world became more secular, and Christmas celebrations became more focused on consumerism, So it seemed that the need for a figure who personified belief in the power of kindness, love, and generosity became more urgent, and Santa Claus became the focus for this need. One of my own favourite examples of this aspect of Santa is to be found in the 1947 Hollywood film Miracle on 34th Street, which works on two levels as an enchanting Christmas fairy tale for children, but also as a poignant parable for adults on the enduring importance of maintaining hope and belief. It stars Edmund Gwen as Kris Kringle, a sweet elderly gentleman who lives in an old people's home in Long Island and who claims to be the real Santa Claus. After he's employed by the New York department store, Macy's, to be their official seasonal mascot, Chris takes it upon himself to restore belief in Santa Claus to two people. Doris, the kind-hearted but cynical store event director, who's played by Maureen O'Hara, and her daughter Susan, who's played by an eight-year-old, Natalie Wood. It's an utterly charming film, and it was remade in 1994 with Richard Attenborough as Chris Kringle. Which version you prefer tends to largely depend on which version you first saw as a child. Although personally, I enjoy both films immensely and watch either one or the other, or sometimes both, every Christmas. Of course, Santa Claus has appeared on screen many times over the years. His film debut occurred in a silent short made in 1897 called Santa Claus Filling Stockings. And as the film industry developed, he became a popular staple in movies that hoped to catch a little of the magic and capitalise on the popularity of Christmas. 
The same considerations have also made Santa Claus a continual target for advertisers who hope that a little of his magic will rub off on their products. One particular manufacturer of sugary fizzy drinks, who shall remain nameless, has been co-opting his image since 1931, and over the years, Santa has also been used to sell everything, from cars and whiskey to sunglasses and smartphones. Yet in spite of so much rampant appropriation, and in spite of the fact that, these days, he is so heavily associated with gift-giving and the consumerist side of Christmas, the figure of Santa Claus somehow still manages to rise above the buzz of seasonal shopping. He remains, for many, the ultimate personification of Christmas, a distillation of all that is joyful, generous, kind and good, and a symbol of the mysterious power of these qualities to create magic and wonder in the collective heart and mind of humanity. This brings me to the end of my talk about the history of Santa Claus, and I do hope you've enjoyed it. I hope, too, that you have a magical Christmas, and that, if you write a letter to Santa this year, he brings you gifts in abundance. Thank you for your company. Goodbye.